Welcome to our A to J Author 2017 training series. This is Jessica Frank, A to J Author Program Manager for the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. This is the fourth video in our training series that covered how A to J Author and Hot Docs work together, an overview of the A to J Author software and basic question design, macros and functions, and finally this video which covers repeat loops, advanced logic, and tips and tricks from our experienced authors. So first off, what is a repeat loop? Um, a repeat loop can also be called a repeat dialogue. In hot docs, the questions are called dialogues. So those kind of two words, loop or dialogue, are interchangeable. It is a series of questions that will display to your end user multiple times based on their input. You want to use a repeat loop if you have the same type of information that needs to be collected several times, and you don't want to have to create the questions uh, multiple times in your interview. So for example, um, the child's name, child's birth date, child's address, their father, uh, where they go to school, all that kind of information needs to be collected multiple times based on how many children the end user has, and so a repeat loop is a great way to do that. There are two ways in A to J Author to do repeat loops, and both have the same outcome, but they have a different front end interaction with the end user. So the first way we're gonna talk about is collecting the number of items or the number of people, the number of times the end user has to go through the loop first. You ask them up front for that number. The second way is to ask if there are any more items or people at the end of the question uh, series of loops. And when I get to each one of these, I'll talk about uh, the best case for where they use them. So the first way is collecting the number up front. You're going to use this when your end user is going to know right away how many times they need to go through the loop. And you ask for that number. So for example, the, the um, the example I always use is when how many children somebody has. That theoretically should be a fairly easy question for somebody to answer. Um, they're not going to have to think about it or go through a list first to figure out if they have more children to add at the end. So you can ask them up front how many children they have and right away uh, you as the author are telling the software how many times it has to go through the loop. Okay, so the first two steps, you create the set of questions that will, will repeat. So I like as an author to have a script or an outline going forward so I know what questions I have to ask before I actually dive into the software. So I know ahead of time that, um, for example, if I'm asking about children, I know that the form's gonna ask for their name, their birth date, and their father's name, for example. So I, I create those three questions. So I um, create the variables that I'm gonna need. So child name, first name, child last name, child middle name if you need it, uh, child date of birth, and uh, father, child father, uh, TE name. So I create those, I make the questions, three separate questions, and then I go back to the variables tab and I create a counting variable. The counting variable is going to be a way for, for the software to track how many times the user has gone through a set of questions. It has to be a number on the variables tab, so it, uh, the type has to be number. We also uh, generally use a different naming convention than we do for, for um, other variables. One, because this variable is not going to be used in hot dogs. So um, it doesn't have to follow any kind of naming convention. Also, um, it lets me see right away that it is a counting variable and it's not a variable that's used in question text to, that's not filled in by the end user. So I, uh, the, the naming convention I follow is, for example, here, child count. Both child and count are capitalized, no space, and no two uh, letter indicator at the end to indicate the number time, I, uh, the number type. I don't have NU after it. So just child count. Whatever you name it, it does have to be a number variable type. The third step is to create the first question in the, in the loop. This first question is a jumping off point. It's not going to be repeated to the end user. They're not going to have to answer how many children several times. So they only need to answer it once. It's a jumping off point. So on this how many question, you on step four, um, at, at, the, at the destination um, on, on the button section, 
under destination. So the destination question should be the first question that's actually going to be repeated. So you can see in this screenshot in the bottom right that it is two dash child's name. That's my very first question that will be repeated. Repeat options. By default, it says normal, but there is a little drop down menu. You're going to click on that and you're going to select set counting variable to one. And you're going to tell A to J what counting variable to use. So I start typing child count, it auto populates, um, and now A to J is set. When the end user clicks this button, the continue, after they say how many kids they have, they hit continue, A to J is going to set child count to one. So it knows that this is now, they're jumping into that first loop. Then step five on all the questions that are to be repeated. So um, actually in my example here, I have two questions that will be repeated the child's name and the child's birth date. On both of those questions, under the text section, you can see here is right under help audio, there's a field called counting variable. It's usually left blank, but when you're doing repeat loops, you need to tell A to J that this question is part of the, a loop, and the loop it is part of is the loop tied to the counting variable child count. So you put the child count variable there, and on every question that is to be repeated, you can see in the map section that uh, in the yellow column here, how many children is a number pick variable, and it has no loop. So you can tell when something is part of a repeat loop because we have a little icon that looks like this circle arrow with the word loop. So that tells me that I have put child count in that counting variable field on child's name and child's birth date. The next type of uh, question, or the next type of repeat loops that we're going to talk about is that asking to add more at the end. So you can see that the loop is also on these two purple questions, 2 dash asset name and 3 dash anymore. This is just a way to see quickly if uh, your question is part of a loop. This little loop symbol also shows up on the pages tab at the end of the question's name if it's part of a loop. Step six is on the very last question that's going to be repeated. So in my case, it's child's birth date. If you remember, I had one dash how many children, two dash child's name, and three dash birth date, child's birth date. On this last question, I'm going to tell A to J that when they click the button, the continue button, after they give me their kid's birth date, I want to increment counting variable and add the, variable, the counting variable child count. So I tell A to J that basically they've finished the loop once uh, and go ahead and mark that the loop is complete. Okay, so um, back to step six. Um, so we have incremented the counting loop. We've told A to J that the end user has finished the loop. Now we have to create some logic to test against, uh, to test child count against how many times they told us they needed to go through the loop which is stored in the variable, in my example, number of children and you. So we create this condition that you can see in the screenshot at the bottom of the screen here. So if child count equals number of children, so they've gone through the loop the number of times they said they had to go through the loop, I want to send them to a question called one dash do you have any? So move them out of the loop into the next section. Otherwise, so if child count, they haven't gone through the number of times they said they needed to go through, send them back to that first question in that's to be repeated, which is two dash child's name. So if true, send them out of the loop. If false, take them back to the beginning question of the loop and let them go again, which will set the counter again each time after they hit the continue button. The second way of doing repeat loops, which is asking to add more at the end. You use this in the case when an end user is likely not to know how many times they have to go through the loop, and you ask them if they want to add another one at the end. So for example, many people don't know offhand how many assets over $100 they have, but if they start making a list, and I'll show you a way to remind people of what they've already told you, so if they start making a list, they may eventually be like, yes, okay, and this, and this, and this, and this, rather than asking them, you know, I have 3,000 things over $100 or 10 things over $100. You wouldn't know necessarily off the top of your head how many times you have to go through the loop. Same thing create as uh, the other way. Step one, create that set of questions you want repeated. 
So um, for this example, I have the name of the asset and how much it's worth is uh, the only question in my loop. Um, so then you also create a counting variable, just like the other way. This one is called asset count, it's also a number. Um, on the first question, which is the jumping off point, the do you have any, because you don't want to send somebody through a loop if they don't actually have any assets or any things to tell you about. So the first question has two paths, a yes and a no path. This is the do you have any question. If yes, go into the loop, which we'll talk about here on step three. If no, branch them out of the loop uh, to the next set of questions. So on that yes button, the destination is to dash asset name, which is my first question to be repeated in this loop. I'm going to set the counting variable to one again. I'm initializing the count, and the counting variable is asset count. On the no button, you would just branch them out to the next one. There's nothing uh, you would have to do. The destination is the next question, and the repeat options is normal because they're not ever going to touch the loop. On all of the questions that you want repeated, you throw this counting variable into the counting variable field. You do not put it on that do you have any question. You can see again that the loop symbol is showing up on the map. Step five on the last question. So um, in my example, I have that do you have any question? That's number one. Two is asset name and it's gonna asset value. It's a two part question there. It's a two field question. And the third question in my section here is, do you have any more to add? Do you have another? Um, this do you have another question is repeated to the end user. So it is the last question in your loop. Um, and it is uh, it will have that counting variable assigned to it. So it is part of the loop because it gets asked each time. On this one, there are again two paths. Yes, takes them back through the loop. No, takes them out of the loop. So on the yes button, on this last question that's being repeated to the end user, the destination is that asset name, that second question, the first question in the loop. Um, we're gonna increment the counting variable and we're gonna tell A to J which counting variable to increment, which is asset count. So again, this is telling the software the end user has been through the loop and has finished the loop. On the no button, you just branch them out, they're done. So you take them to whatever the next step or next section is, next question, um, and the repeat options are normal. And then you're done, there's no logic in the asking to add more section. Um, you just keep having the end user manually push themselves through the loop. So variables in general, in a repeat dialogue, in any question that's repeated are treated exactly norm uh, the same. Um, they're set up the same way, child name first TE, the only difference, which I'll show you in A to J here, my sample, is on the variables tab. If it is to be repeated, you have to make sure that the variable is set to check if multiple values. Let me zoom in on that. This tells A to J to allow multiple values to be held by this variable. If you don't check this, every time the end user goes through a loop, they're going to override the answer before. So if it only if you don't have this checked, A to J only allows one answer. So each time it overrides an answer, the last answer. If this is checked, multiple values can be held by this variable, and A to J will start indexing them and separating them out. So that's the only difference with variables. That uh, asset count or child count, whatever your counting variable is, do not check this because it's a normal number. It does not need to hold multiple values. It only needs to hold the one value, um, whatever the count is. And the only difference on a question in general um, that is part of a repeat loop is that you have this repeating uh, counting variable in the question text section that you indicate that it's part of the loop. Sorry about that. I don't know why my screenshot's not working there. Let me just reset that real quick. kind of half there. Um, so what this was, sorry about that, this is a screenshot of um, the uh, variables and script window when it's open in preview, which I'll show you in author in a second. Um, it shows you that the um, variables are stored in an index. So child last name has Frank and Frank, one and two. First name, Allison and Madison. 
So um, A to J starts building an index the more times you go through the loop. So each variable is given um, uh, an index number associated with where it falls in the list of uh, input values. Um, and the way, so what I was going to show you is a way in which you can help your end user remember which part of the loop they're on or which asset or which child they're talking about or what they've already told you about. So for example, on this, do you have any more for the assets? I'm going to give them help. They might think, um, which ones have I already told you about? And I'm going to help them by pulling out all of the values they've told me about using a macro. But it's simple. All you have to say is, uh, all you as the author have to type in is, you've told me about your, and then use a macro to call out all of the values held in the variable asset name TE. This is particularly helpful on the um, asking to add more at the end because it reminds them what they've already told you about. Most people aren't going to have a pad of paper sitting next to them at the computer and they're not going to be jotting down what they've already told you about. So this gives them that information quickly. And A to J automatically adds a, a comma and the word and if there's more than one. Um, it starts building the list grammatically for you. The other way to use a macro in uh, repeat loops is to use the ordinal function. So for example, I am using a macro to call out the ordinal value held by child count, which you remember is a number. So what this will display to the end user the first time they're through the loop, will say what is the name of the first child. Next time they go through, what is the name of the second child, and so forth. Um, and then I use this macro to call out the child's name specifically in the next question. So the first question, they tell me the name of their child, and then in the next question, I say, what is that child's date of birth? So what is Allison or Benjamin's or Thomas's date of birth? And I do that with a macro, um, percent sign, percent sign, bracket, child's name first, TE, which is my variable, pound the counting variable, close brackets, double percent signs. So what this tells A to J is call out the value of child for name first TE pound, because it's indexing those multiple values, whatever count they're currently on. So each time it will only call out the name of the child held by whatever iteration of the loop the end user is in, rather than with the asset one where I didn't have pound asset count, it calls out all the values. So this is a way to call out a specific value rather than all of the values held by a variable. Let's see if this one's working. Okay, so this is an example then, uh, what I was just talking about. Um, we'll run quickly through the sample interview I've created. If at any time you all would want this sample to check out in your own um, account and to play with, feel free to email me and I can um, drop it over to you. So this is just a quick sample exercise or a uh, sample interview that I created. Um, whenever I'm working an author, I like to keep this variables and script window open, but it doesn't have to be open. This is what it would look like if um, it was seen by an end user. Let me zoom a bit for you. Okay, so for example, if we just run through this, how many children? I have a list that only allows one through nine, two children, first name, now, what is Allison's date of birth? Now, it's gone through the loop. If we open up the script, it tested logic to see if I've gone through the loop appropriate number of times. I haven't because child count, which I said was two, does not equal, or sorry, number of children, which I said was two, does not equal child count because I'd only gone through the count uh, once. And it's also incremented child count to two now, so that's why it's showing what is the name of the second child. Again, it's calling out a specific birth date. So now, if you notice the on line 20 here, it's green, it's true, because child count does equal number of children, and now it has moved me on to the do you have any question. So here is do you have any assets? Um, yes, I do have assets, asset of a house. Do I have another to add? So which ones have I already told you about? You've told me about your house. 
I say yes, I have another one. Car. What have, how many, or do you have any more? What have I told you about? I've told you about your my house and car. If I kept going, it would add a comma in and keep this and there. And it will continue to make the list for the end user. If I click no, it bounces me out to the end of the interview. So that's just a quick example to see how repeat loops act in person. The next topic to talk about in this video for is advanced logic. We've already covered the basics of advanced logic in video two when I introduced you to the A to J author software, but we'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about what logic can do and how it works within A to J author. If you'll remember, you write logic scripts in either the before or after box in the question design window on the pages tab. This tells A to J author to test whatever logic scripts you write, either before the user presses the button, so before they see the question even, or after the user presses the button. These simple if-else if, statements are completely controlled with five commands in A to J author. If, else, go to, set, and end if. All if statements must have an end if, just like every sentence has to have a capital letter, and punctuation at the end. Each of these logic statements must be on their own line. There has to be a hard return or the enter key between each of these statements. You can find all of your logic statements on the all logic tab. This lets you see all of the active logic that is running in your entire guided interview. Each of these logic boxes are also editable. So if you make a mistake and you need to make changes to your entire interview, Instead of opening up each page and editing the logic on that page, you can edit all of the logic here from the All Logic tab. With advanced logic, you can do simple mathematical expressions, for example, set annual income NU to whatever number they give you for the monthly income times 12. You can also use complex logic statements by adding an and or or. So if the number of children and you, the number they tell you they have of children, is greater than one, and their household size is less than three, you can take them onto a question like something you don't qualify, or you can set some other variable based on these uh, combined conditions. Advanced logic supports the following symbols, and it, the symbol is on the left, and the explanation of what it is is on the right. So within those mathematical equations, within logic, you can use equals, does not equal, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, or use the word is for equals. A couple of tips and tricks from our more experienced authors. It's always good to start with a script or an outline. When I'm first training authors, I highly recommend at least coming up with the order in which you want to ask the questions. So figuring out the steps, the larger headlines, and then either fully writing out what the question is or just what variables you need to cover in which order. So this script, before you ever touch the software itself, will give you an outline or an overview of what your interview should look like. Remember, the form doesn't dictate what the interview is. You as the author get to say the order in which the questions are displayed to your end user. So you really want to think out what is the best way to present this information to the end user, group questions that are like each other, even if they are not grouped together on the form itself, and think about asking your end user to get to the end in the least amount of questions possible. If you're looking to do translations, you can run a transcript report from the Reports tab. This will allow you to download a copy of all the text from your interview that would need to be translated by your translator and then you're able to copy and paste it back into um, your interview once you've had the translator go through it and make those changes for you. If you're looking to do any editing and peer reviewing of your interview and you don't want someone to have to play around with the software itself, you can download a full report from the reports tab and that lets someone else go through your interview and see everything that it contains in the interview itself. It's also graded with the writeclearly.org's tools. So um, we've included Flesh Kincaid and other grading tools so that you can see where your interview falls in terms of plain language. A couple of additional resources on top of this training video series that you've now completed. 
Our authoring guide can be found on our website under content slash A to J authoring guide. It's also under the learn tab. Uh, the authoring guide is several hundred pages of step-by-step -step instructions and explanations um, about A to J author. It's essentially our software manual. So going through that, you can search by uh, topic within it and drill down by chapters if you're having trouble with a uh, specific component of software. What I recommend when you've completed this training series is to now go do the sample exercise. There's a sample exercise that is associated with a hot docs template and a sample exercise that is associated with an A to J template. Both of those can be found under our, our website under content slash sample exercises learn A to J author. The final thing to talk about is our A to J author document assembly tool, the DAT. Information about that, which is a, another back end tool that can be used in place of hot docs for certain simple forms and motions. You can find out more about that in chapter 15 of our authoring guide, um, which is also on the website here. Thank you for watching our video series. This entire series, along with other training webinars, can be found on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash A to J author. As always, if you have questions, you can feel free to email me, jessica at cali.org. Thank you.